Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you so much for joining us for another segment. In this segment, we're going to have a conversation with Ms. Jean Ford. She's joining us here as a diabetic and a cancer survivor to discuss the challenges that she faced from her type 2 diabetes, as well as the treatment plan and the education that received from the doctors at Wild Cornell Medicine enabled her to live a medication-free lifestyle. Welcome to Health Professional Radio. Jean Ford, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Give our listeners a bit of uh, background to tell us a little bit about yourself and what your life was like before you were diagnosed with diabetes. Well, I'm a retired corporate executive, and my life was building a business afterwards where I had an opportunity to help young students um, receive scholarships to go into college. Mm -hmm. So I was pretty much focused on that and not really thinking I had any issues. I know I needed cataract surgery, and so when I was uh, into my pre-diagnosis treatment for that, and they said, you have diabetes, I was actually shocked. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I did. I didn't feel anything. I didn't know anything about it, and so it was just like a blast uh, um, that just took me off my feet. So with that, I ended up having to get educated, find doctors, but I have to say that the doctors that I had initially were very supportive in helping me. I was in Buffalo, mm-hmm. and they told me, what you need to do now is find a doctor in New York, and that's how I ended up with Wild Cornell Physicians. In your being educated about your uh condition, did you discover that there was a a family history? Did you start looking into things that may have happened that you'd had no idea in your family? I knew that my brother had diabetes Mm -hmm. and he passed, but not necessarily from that. My sister, who is my only other sibling, did not. My parents did not. Mm -hmm. I do believe Mm -hmm. that there were indications that maybe I was pre-diabetic that I ignored for instance, when the doctors would say after blood tests, um, your A1C is a little high. I never questioned what that meant or what I needed to do about that. Mm. So I'm, I, this is my judgment that I'm thinking that that was an indication that there was something going on there. Um, so the family history didn't lead to anything. The lack of follow-up for my doctors uh, kept me, I think, in the dark about the mm. situation. What were some of your initial fears when you were first diagnosed? I have to say that my first question to the doctors in Buffalo was, why is there such a stigma towards diabetes? If it's an illness, why do people treat as though you have something that you could have controlled, you could have fixed, you had no no business having, and therefore you must be a physical slob? Mm -hmm. And that was the first beginning, the beginning of the education that it does not indicate what your lifestyle is it's just it is a medical condition so that led me to do some research about it i think the doctors would drop tid this is not only the doctors at wild cornell but the doctors in buffalo as well they would drop tidbits about what the blood high blood sugar does to your body how it can affect other organs this is something i didn't know Mm -hmm. and it made me step back and take it very seriously because it meant that my eyes that I was initially looking at the cataracts could be affected. My heart could be affected. I thought diabetes was a standalone disease and that it did not affect all the organs in the body. And that was a big education jump for me. Did you realize the uh, enormity of the challenges that you were about to face as far as um, your lifestyle, your diet, maybe medication, things of that nature, and, and along with this uh, newfound uh, stigma that you were going to have to deal with as well? I did. And one of the things that anyone who knows me will tell you that once I get focused on something, I can be very disciplined. One of the things the doctors in Buffalo told me is you can't have your surgery you must take care of the diabetes. You must get it, get the blood sugar levels lowered. We can help you do that. They never pushed in the sense that, oh, you poor person. They actually said, together we can make this happen. But initially, Mr. Howard, what it did for me was make me so focused on everything I ate, everything I did, that I was just overwhelmed by it. And I had to gradually get to the point where I could relax into this new lifestyle, this new awareness. It meant that, yes, go for your walk. Yes, control 
and given the fact that we were into the pandemic in 2020, I could control what I ate because mm-hmm. I wasn't going to restaurants. I think in New York City, they were closed. To you, you know, your options weren't yeah. open. So yeah. I learned to cook, and I learned to cook the right things. Not always initially, but Rachel helped me with <laughs> learning that, well, that's not exactly what you want to eat because I thought I was just doing the right thing. It was a vegetable. I could have it. So I did learn gradually. And then one of the things that really helped was they, Rachel and Dr. Jack had a seminar. And I think it was some of their diabetic patients, and it could have been other people just wanting to know. And one of the questions that I ask is, once you've been diagnosed, are you always diabetic Do you, can you ever reverse the situation and I asked that question because I never thought I had it so if I'm just getting it can I go back to where I was and Dr. Jack said if you can get yourself to the point where you're off medication for a while and your blood sugar levels are lower you are in a state of remission and I'm proud to say that with their help I have been six months in the mission. Great, great. Was it mainly your doctor's uh, support and education that formulated your particular treatment plan? Or were you extremely involved in, you know, looking up different recipes and and maybe learning new exercise regimens and things of that nature? I'm asking because there are others who are going to be in your situation. And you don't sound like someone who just sat back and said, "Okay, do everything for me. Fix me. <laughs> no, I will say that if you have great medical professionals helping you, listen to them and do what they say. What they did was they guided me. They said exercise is important. Formulate your exercise program. One of the things that I did was as soon as I could get off the finger stick part and use a sensor, I was very happy with that because that was just the most painful part of the whole process. And what that allowed me to do was as I exercised, I could tell if this was a good regimen for me or not. I can change that up. I can switch that. As I ate different things, given the fact that what I learned about carbs and what I learned about the sodium levels and what I learned about uh, fats and all of those things from Rachel, I could see how it was affecting me. I could make the choices between drinking a glass of Prosecco or having a piece of birthday cake. Mm. I realized early on I couldn't have those, so I would make those kinds of choices. I had to navigate the support or obstacles that friends put in my place, which is, oh, go on and have that glass of wine. It's Mm -hmm. no big deal. You know. Mm And it gradually, it got to the point where the conversation became, are you drinking? And if you're not, they would go move on. And it wasn't a, a push or a force to do that. So it was it was the support of the doctors. It was knowing what I could and couldn't do. It was using their guidance to develop the recipes. And it was using their guidance to develop the exercises and follow the medical regimen. I took the medicine as long as it was prescribed. I did exactly what I was supposed to do each day. I measured the blood sugar level and sent those into the doctors. And with that information, they were able to tell me we're moving on to the next phase, which is medicated free, medication free, and uh, continue and we'll look at it every three months. Uh, Mr. Howard, those three months off um, goalposts were important too, because it meant there were bite-sized pieces of measurement. It wasn't wait to the end of the year and find out how you are. It was I was able to find out sooner rather than later if things were working and we were able to adjust. And that's how we went from insulin to insulin plus injectables to just the injectable to just a a pill to no pill. And because we had it every three months. Outstanding. What advice do you have for others who will find themselves in your position, maybe at the same level, you know, living their lives just as you were, you know, looking to the future? What advice do you have for them and what is your outlook on the future? I can tell you my outlook is hopeful. When Dr. Jack said you can get to a state of remission, that was hope for me. And that led me to um, realize that if I followed her guidance, Rachel's guidance, uh, together as a team, we can do it. 
I believe that the most important thing I did was finding the right doctors. I did have a doctor in between the ones in Buffalo and Dr. Jack and Rachel who said to me, I don't know if I can help you because you're insulin dependent. I didn't even know what that meant, but I knew that the attitude was not the supportive attitude I wanted. Mm -hmm. So I think finding the right professionals is very key. And then following their advice, doing what they say. I am very hopeful that with continued guidance and with a, a, the determination that I have, I can live a good life. I can live a long life. I was asked once by somebody, do you have advice for other people? I find that the people who listen to me and who accept what I have to say mm -hmm. are not could be or who want to do, have a better situation right now without being diabetic. There are people who um, are committed to, who are on medication and think that that's way to go and there is no hope for them. I'm not saying that they're doomed. I'm just saying that they have decided that that is the lifestyle path they want to follow. Mm -hmm. And I find that by, I'm not shoving, I'm not pushing. I'm just, if anyone asks, I'd say, here's what I did. Maybe you can do it too. Jean, it's been a pleasure speaking with you this morning. I'm very happy that uh, you are drug uh, medication free and um, living living your life in such a positive manner. I thank you for joining us this morning and sharing your story. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with Ms. Jean Ford. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.